I went into the world ignorantly in unbelief. I graduated from a Southern Missionary College with a degree in theology and with honors. I had a lot of biblical knowledge, but what I did not have was an understanding of God's plan for my personal salvation. And I went into the world very bitter and very angry against God. As I was going through my divorce, um, I went to some counseling with my wife, primarily to um, just placate her, I suppose. I felt at that point that I was un totally unchangeable. And I remember as I went through this counseling with her, at the end of these sessions, generally the counselor would call her in and he would tell her, you know, Mrs. Woolsey, you need to just divorce this man and get on with your life. That kind can never change. These were Seventh-day Adventist Christian counselors, psychiatrists, uh, even some very well-known pastors and theologians. I praise God that there are many faithful ones within our denomination, but I was very disappointed in the few that I met with, and I went into the world very bitter and angry against God himself because I didn't feel that I was changeable. I had been wrestling with this gay issue all of my life. I felt that I was just born that way, that I was different. I was made to feel that way as I was growing up. But, um, but to hear this from professional people that were supposed to have the answers just kind of seared me against God and against truth, against religion. And, um, and so I was very bitter and angry. But how did it all begin? I was... Uh, I was only four years old when I was sexually molested by a farmhand. And I remember, and, and first of all, I want to thank Dr. Lucille Ball for her amazing information this morning. She was telling my story. I was that little boy that was not built like the football player brothers that I had. And I was musically inclined. And I was in the country in Mississippi. And I grew up being called a sissy because I would rather play the piano than play football. And, then, and no one knew I had been sexually molested because, you know, even the victim, I think, quite often feels responsible. Even at four years old, I felt I had done something terribly wrong. I had done something dirty, and I was guilty. And I did not tattle on myself. I wasn't about to tell mommy and daddy what I had just been involved in. So that internalized. And then those, those repressed feelings, that repressed trauma began to uh, display itself in different ways. I became a bedwetter and a pants wetter and I became a, an embarrassment to my father, uh, especially. And uh, this subjected me to much teasing. And in later years, and I know now that my father dearly loved all of his children, but he was a child raising children he was 17 when he was married. He fathered six children. And my mother many times over the years said, you know, your dad was the most difficult child I had to raise. <laughs> but he admitted to me in a moment of beautiful reconciliation later in life, Ronnie, can you ever forgive me for all that I did all those years? I was simply trying to shame you into becoming what I thought you should be. And I was wrong. And we had beautiful reconciliation. But being molested at the age of four was just the beginning of a string of events through my childhood and my life that made me grow up feeling different, unaccepted, unloved, unappreciated, uh, unequal with uh, the boys, the older brothers that I had who were into all of the rough, tough things, you know, mechanics and hot rods and guns and things, you know, things that made loud noise. And I like to make music, not noise. And so that um, made me feel like a, a misfit within my family. But uh, I grew up, even at that, as a spiritual child. I loved the Lord and I wanted to be a Christian. I made many wonderful choices in my life. I personally chose to go to a Christian self-supporting uh, academy that was very, uh, very religious, very spiritual and self-supporting. Um, uh, they had a uh, work-study program and lots of music. 
I chose to be a missionary for two years in Korea and in Thailand. I chose to be married despite what I felt. And I know, Dr. Bald, you're going to laugh at this, but I thought that marriage would be the solution to all of my problems. What a terrible thing to do to an innocent young woman who loved the Lord and wanted to be a minister's wife. I married her thinking that she would solve all of my problems, and instead I became all of her problems. And it ruined our marriage because we had two beautiful children, but by the end of two years, I just could not repress any longer that boil that you were talking about, that what happened to me had festered all of those years inside like a nasty boil and eventually it just erupted. And when it did, there was no turning back. And I broke my wife's heart. I broke my parents' hearts. My dad had a massive heart attack shortly after I came out of the closet as a gay person. And he almost died. He was given five years to live if he would have bypass surgery. And dad said, well, what if I don't? have the surgery, and the same surgeon said, well, Mr. Woolsey, you won't live five years if you don't have that surgery. You do the math. He checked himself out and never had the surgery, and he lived to be 90. Instead, he, the heart attack was at 55, and he lived to be 90 instead of 60. Uh, following God's health plan, my mother and my father went into God's health plan and really studied it and changed their lives. But Nevertheless, when he had that heart attack, I felt responsible. I saw his grief. I saw his heartbreak. I saw his despair. And so not only did I go into the world with all of this guilt, now I had this burden to carry, that my father was going to die and I was the cause of it. But I had no answers. I just felt I was born this way. And so... Uh, in the world, I just continued to blame God and tried to drown all of my, my sorrow and my hurt and my pain by just living it up in the gay life. But I had those praying parents and praying friends that gave the Lord permission to never let me go. And they gave him permission to do whatever it took to interrupt my life, to get my attention, to bring me back to the Lord. You know, I'm really going to have to lay aside this southern drawl or I'll never get through this, this session in the time that I'm allotted. But um, the Lord started visiting me, and I know he visited me in this recurring nightmare because I've never had this dream. Since I accepted Jesus 21 years ago, I have never had this dream or anything like it. But on a recurring basis, I would have this nightmare of living through the coming of Jesus as a lost person. And friends, I cannot, my words could never express the horror that I experienced watching Jesus come in the clouds of glory, knowing that I was lost for all eternity. I truly believe the Lord was reaching down to me as a poor, degraded son. Son, give me thine heart. Don't go through this. He was giving me a foretaste of what it would be like so that I would make choices and I would choose not to go through that. And so it, this went on for about three years. You know, with Jonah, it was three days. With me, it was like three years. I was a hard nut to crack. But Eventually, I kind of got the message, and I remember one day it just kind of hit me like a thunderbolt. You know, I can keep on blaming God for everything wrong in my life and all the pain and suffering I'm causing everybody else. I'm still lost. Nothing has changed. Blaming is just self-justification. And how can God justify me if I'm just justifying myself all the time? It doesn't work. And I determined that I was going to find answers for myself. I did not go to a therapist. I didn't trust them. I'm sorry, I didn't know where to go. I wouldn't trust a human being. And so um, I started doing my own research of my life, and I went back and I started connecting all of the dots, and I began to realize I wasn't born this way. I was derailed. I was a perfectly normal little boy until that first experience and when I had that first experience, that's all I could think about. Every day of my life, I relived that in my mind, and it conditioned me to think in that direction by the time I hit puberty and, and started realizing what boys and girls are all about. I already had 10 years of a head start of boys and boys in my mind. And so I was conditioned to think that way. Um, my parents, bless their hearts, they... they 
they never had uh, much money. They, they, were, they were not well-to-do, and, and uh, they lived in Mississippi, but they loved their prodigal son. And I was living in Southern California, and they found a way somehow to get out to California almost every year to spend time with me. I have a sister that lives in Newport Beach and has all of these years, and they would visit her, but they usually stayed with me in my home with my friends inland in the smog. Now, you on the West Coast know what that means. I tell that back home. They go, what? You know? Well, I lived inland in the smog, and she lived in Newport Beach. That's a story in itself. But they chose to stay with me in my home. They loved me, and they loved my friends, and we could see that. Never once did we feel that they condoned our behavior. But never once did we see condemnation either. And that's the way Jesus works. And, you know, if you're taking notes, there are three things that my parents did that I think really helped the Lord turn me around. First of all, they loved me unconditionally, uh, which I just expressed. They prayed for me without ceasing. And they became forgetful. I was, you know... I was one of those people who was unchangeable. I already realized that, but I had become unreachable. I wouldn't read anything, watch anything, listen to anything, go anywhere or talk to anybody that had anything to do with religion. I was unreachable. So they just became forgetful. And every time they went home, they left something behind. <laughs> and quite often I would find it under my pillow in my bed <laughs> with a note in it. And you know, over the years, I collected this Left Behind series, and I'm telling you, this was, this was the real Left Behind series. You would not find this in the fiction section of the bookstore. There was a beautiful Bible. I had this nine-volume set called Testimonies to the Church, all left behind. I had a five-volume set, Conflict of the Ages series. I had Steps to Christ, and I had the, the story of redemption, and those are just the ones that I can remember. But... Um, when I started researching my life, I determined, you know, I'm going to study for myself and not for the professors. I'm going to find my answers because it doesn't make sense that I was born this way because then God could rightfully be blamed for who and what I am. And so I went to my Left Behind series. I pulled out the Bible and I opened it and I tried to read something and I put it back. I couldn't do it. It was just too heavy. My mind was mush from being a TV addict all those years. And, and I couldn't concentrate on anything of substance. So I pulled out, there's a little book, the smallest book in the Left Behind Library, and it had great big print and little short chapters, and it's very thin. You know what the book it was, right? That's right, Steps to Christ. But I couldn't even sit down comfortably to read that. So I went into the kitchen, and I pulled out a blender, and I dumped in a bunch of ice and yellow stuff and green stuff and blended it all up together. And I went back into my living room with a great big double Midori margarita. And then I sat down and lit up a cigarette, and I started drinking and smoking, and I relaxed and started reading Steps to Christ. Now, I don't recommend this kind of Bible study. But you know, the Lord meets us where we are. And that's where I was. And, and I was reading page one and it dawned on me, you know, there's something wrong with this picture. But this is who I am. So I had a little short talk with the Lord and I remember saying, Lord, this is not my issue and neither is this. I didn't leave you over cigarettes and margaritas. These came along much later. I'm going to continue relaxing and reading and you show me the answers in your word, and then we'll talk margaritas and cigarettes later. That lasted until chapter 5. <laughs> Let me read with you what I found in chapter 5 of, uh, <clears throat> of Steps to Christ. And I was, uh, as I was reading this, I reached over and put out my cigarette. God does not ask us to give up anything that is good for us to keep. He is thinking of what is best for us. I wish that all who have not chosen Christ could realize this. Christ has something far better for them than they could ask for themselves. People are not being fair to themselves when they go against what God wants. Did you hear that? What God wants. You know, as a homosexual, I was focused upon what Ronnie wanted. My feelings, my emotions, 
my temptations, my desires, my lusts, self-advancement, self-glory, self-gratification, self-gratification. Did I say self-gratification? You know, everything I wanted. But here I'm realizing that God's plan for my life far exceeded anything I could even imagine for myself. What a stupid person I was to think that I had all the answers and, and focusing upon myself. If I focused upon God and His desire, after all, God is love. And so his desire for me would be much greater, greater than anything I could imagine. And so I remember putting out the cigarette. That's when I stopped smoking and drinking while reading the Bible and the Word of God. It was later that I stopped smoking and drinking altogether, much later actually. But the point is, as I was reading the Word of God, friends, there's power in the Word. Recreative power. And I'm sad to say there's not power, in, well, I'm glad to say there's not power in the reference because so often I can't remember the reference, but Jesus didn't seem to either. He just always said it is written. So that's what I say. <laughs> the devil knows where it is, and he knows it's the Word of God. So I, I quote the Word of God, and I don't worry about the reference so often. But anyway, these were stepping stones, and the Lord led me through my study. He led me step by step to realize that I could be a new creature in Christ. And I remember my dad, you know, had been given five years to live, but they were visiting in California the, the, the day that I took a stand for Jesus. And they, had, they always asked me to take them to church on Sabbath. And yeah, 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 so I took them to church. But this time I didn't really resist, and I took them to a church I had been visiting. And at the end of the sermon, the pastor gave a call, and they were there to see me stand up and go forward. That was, I, I was taking a stand for Jesus, but that's not when I was, when I left the gay life. That came later. But um, as I continued studying, and, and, and I would be remiss if I did not share with you some of the answers that I found. First of all, I realized that all of my life, I was just trusting my own feelings and emotions, but God himself says the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? And there is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof is the way of death. And so I was following what I thought was good for me and what was right for me, but I was really going down the path of total destruction. And, you know, last night, this, this text was referred to uh, both times in the presentations, 1 Corinthians 6, 9 to 11. I had visited a pastor, and I was telling him my life story, and I thought I was surprised he didn't fall over backwards in a dead faint when I got to some of my details. But he just sat there, and he batted his eyes, and he listed and when, listened. And when I got through, he said, let me just show you something. And he turned to 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 to 11, listing all of those people or those behaviors that will not be in heaven. And interestingly, interestingly, I found myself in there three or four times, lost. And then he got to verse 11. And such were some of you. Now, this is to the Corinthians. And these were people, uh, homosexuality was rampant in, in Greece. Such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. And I said something really stupid. I didn't know what to say. And I said something really stupid. They just blurted out, you made that up. It didn't say that. Oh, what a thing to say to that man. He said, let me read it again. I didn't want to hear it again. But he read it again. And he got to that. And such were some of you. Then he turned his Bible around and he said, now you read it. And I had to read it. And then he just looked and said, Ron, I don't have to tell you what to do. It's right there. You can be changed. You too can be made whole. That night I went home and I was confronted by my partner. You going to go into all that Jesus stuff? And I started to deny the drawing of the Lord, but I thought, you know, it's time for me to stand up and be a man and face the music. And I said, you know, I think I am. And he jumped up in just hysterics and said, I feel like breaking things. And he ran through the house and I could hear things crashing all through the house as he was breaking things in his rage and fury. And I sat there on the deck outside feeling so much peace. I had taken a second stand 
for Jesus. I had not denied my Lord. I was still gay. I was still in the lifestyle, but I was taking these steps. And, and I realized that I, too, could be changed. Um, I found an answer to this question about being born gay, because I use that argument all my life. It's, I used it as a way to just shut down the conversation. If someone wanted to talk to me about choices, I would say, no, I was born this way. But then, you know, Jesus has an answer for everything, doesn't he? Oh, you're born gay? How about being born again? It's that simple. If you're born with bad genetics, if that's what you think it is, I have a friend, sorry, Michael, this isn't you, but I have another friend who's Italian, and he says, I'm Italian, I'm supposed to be angry. I said, and Jesus was a Jew. And I'm English and Dutch and French and Irish and Cherokee Indian and Swiss, Swedish and Finnish and what am I supposed to be? But if we're born again, we can lay all of that aside. Jesus says, now you can have my ancestry as your ancestry. God the Father will be your father. You can become a partaker of divine nature and you couple that with your human nature and you can meet Satan just like I do. It is written and send him packing. You know, I learned with homosexuality that if I would picture it as the fruit on the forbidden tree, that I could deal with it. And I came to the point where I decided, you know, it's just not an option. God created sexual intimacy to be enjoyed in one way and one way only. It's not a sin to not be sexually intimate but it's a sin to not follow his plan in that area. So, if I'm going to be sexually intimate, there's only one way. And everything else is on that forbidden tree. It's not an option. And I learned to bring every thought into captivity under the obedience of Christ. That to uh, the text in uh, Corinthians talks about casting down imaginations. To me, that means stop fantasizing. Something comes your way, throw it back. Satan throws you a mud ball, sling it back. Nice try, no thanks, not interested. You turn the page, you turn the change the channel, you flip the switch, you turn your head, you, turn, you change the subject. And you just practice doing this. And you immerse yourself in what is good and starve that old side of yourself, and healing can take place. In 2 Corinthians 5, 17, we're told, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Well, you heard I'm from Arkansas. In Arkansas, when they pass away, we bury them. In fact, if we do it within 24 hours, we don't even need to take the person to the funeral home. We can do it ourselves. Old things are passed away. Bury it. All things are become new. Ellen White has a most interesting commentary on all of that, and I'll sum it up in just two of her sentences, that the new birth consists of new motives, new tastes, and new tendencies. Wow, when I read that, I got so excited. And a genuine conversion. What does conversion mean? Change. A genuine conversion changes both hereditary and cultivated tendencies to wrong. So if we want to be born again, God promises He gives us everything we need to be new creatures in Christ. Is He not the Creator? Is He not the Recreator? Yes, He is, and there is power in His Word. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. And it is God who works in us to will and to do of His good pleasure. And we can be confident of this very thing, that He which has begun a good work in us will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. It is the work of the Lord to change us into His image. I can't believe I only have 30 minutes and only three left. <laughs> the best part of the story is yet to come and I can't tell it. So I'm just going to show. I prayed about, when I gave my heart to the Lord, I prayed about second chances and double portions. I was called into ministry the night I was baptized. I was put into ministry and... Uh, I was asked to preach the next Sabbath and have been in ministry ever since. Uh, 21 years now I have been in the ministry for the Lord. I prayed about second chances and 
Uh, would the Lord ever trust me again with family? I had squandered that wonderful gift. Within a year, I was married. And this is my wife. She was Claudia Sutherland. Her great-grandfather started Madison College, by the way, in Sanitarium, E.A. Sutherland. But this is my wife, Claudia, the Lord blessed me with that. My oldest daughter, Melanie, lives in Phoenix, Arizona, and her son, um, uh, in, uh, he is 18 now, and this is my oldest son, David, and his little girl, and there she is, and his wife, and his other little girl, and that is a prize-winning photograph of my little granddaughter. She always has that little smile on her face. And this is uh, my stepson, Derek, Claudia's son, and his little boy, uh, the one in the middle is his little boy. <laughs> and uh, he had a liver transplant a year and a half ago. He's 18 months old and had cancer of the liver. He's now three and he's thriving, doing quite well. This is, now Claudia and I have two children. The Lord blessed us with second chances and double portions. And um, Zachary and his two little horses, Zachary and Natalie, and uh, that, that shot lasted about uh, half a second. <laughs> Natalie and I conspired to get that one, and it worked for about half a second. Uh, there's Zachary. He's quite an artist. He and Natalie go to Oklahoma Academy. He's an artist, and he's a musician. He plays for the chorale and sings in the chorale and, the, and does the bell choir. Uh, there's Natalie. She tends to rescue baby birds. And that is her beautiful little bluebird. Um, and there they are at school banquet last year. My second chances and double portions. As I'm speaking, they are in Ukraine right now on a mission trip with Oklahoma Academy. Did you say I had 30 more minutes? I saw a three there. <laughs> I'm sorry. There is, you know, Revelation 12:11 says we overcome the accuser of the brethren by two things. The blood of the lamb, the story of Jesus Christ. There's power in the blood. And it's through Jesus Christ that I am where I am today. But also we overcome by the word of our testimony. And I didn't know exactly what that meant for so long, but I understand now as I give my story, I'm really giving positive reinforcement to my own mind. When I was asked to write my book, I was asked to use a pen name for my protection. I spent more time coming up with the pen name than writing the book. <laughs> because the message is on the cover, Victor J. Adamson. And you chew on that, and you'll see that there's a mighty message in that. Um, but yes, we all have a story to tell. We all have a testimony. And I'm here to testify that our God is <clears throat> mighty to save the whosoevers, homosexuals included, from whatsoever, even to the uttermost. Praise God.